Okay. So good afternoon. Um, it's an interesting thing to try to model, moderate a, pan, a, t a panel on a topic as dense as intersectional research and practice when already feeling immensely, wonderfully overstimulated by intersectional dialogue. Um, so some of you may be having similar experiences. There's already been just a, a wealth of information to take in today, and we hope that this session will be both grounding and continue that stimulating experience. One of the reasons that these concurrent workshops, these two particular workshops are offered at this time is to give us a little more space to reflect on not necessarily the basics but the foundations uh, that we reference when we talk about intersectionality as, for instance, a basis for research or for advocacy or our sister program in the next room which is focusing on how we read intersectionality, how we teach it. Uh, my name is Becker Bay, first of all. I'm happy to see you all. I'm uh, visiting here at the UCLA Center for the Study of Women and also uh, kind of back and forth at the Syracuse University School of Law in uh, the Burton Blatt Institute. Uh, and I'm really, really privileged and excited to be part of a program that is focused on intersectionality, which is certainly um, both as an agenda and a politic and a theory and a methodological aim, a concept that's particularly dear to me and I know to many folks here. The panel that I'm going to be moderating today, as you know, and the discussion that we're going to be having focuses on the subject of intersectional research and practice. Uh, and one of the reasons that we wanted to couple those two terms together, among the many reasons I would say, is that there's often a divide in academia at large between research and practice. The notion of applied research, advocacy research, and so forth, participatory action research, any of these kinds of models of doing research, much less activist research, uh, is often very segregated from the ways in which we think about the production of knowledge or the formation of theories or methodologies. And so we wanted to remind folks that there should be some resonance, some synchronicity between the on-the-ground work, and since we're in a law school, I'll highlight the fact that, for instance, attorneys and lawyers do, such as my colleague here, Priscilla Ocean, who's on the end, I'm introducing out of order, um, and the work that uh, some of the folks who are breaking ground and setting the stage for ongoing decades of intersectional research are doing, such as my colleagues Ange Marie Hancock, immediately to my left, from the UCA, USC Department of Political Science, and Liz Cole from the uh, Psychology Department at the University of Michigan. I'm going to do just a little bit more biographically. I wanted to identify folks first by name and then say something about what they bring to the panel. I'm going to keep the intros comparatively brief, not because there isn't uh, exciting and impressive content in folks' bios and CVs and so forth, but because, um, like many of you, I assume I'm pretty motivated to save time for the conversation itself. So we'll just do a quick hint of some of the reasons that these folks are so engaged with this particular subject. So let's start to my left this time with Ange Marie Hancock, who is in the Department of Political Science at the University of Southern California here in LA. Um, and I believe has also accepted a directorship at the Center for Feminist Studies, is that correct? Congratulations. Um, and is co-editing a series on intersectionality for Palgrave Macmillan. Um, and has been, at, has a book essentially starting to take apart the ways in which we form identity politics and coalition politics around notions of oppression Olympics. Um, I've had the fortune to hear her speak on that subject before, and I'm very excited to hear her comments, uh, which I believe are related today. Um, Liz Cole has done some of the most uh, exciting work that I've personally read in terms of thinking about what is an intersectionality, which is a concept most folks know originated some 20 plus years ago in law, and thinking about how do we integrate this fully and holistically and meaningfully in psychology as a discipline. And her work has been very pointed in confronting ways in which uh, the approach to intersectional research has to be engaged with the complexity of identity but not lacking a structural analysis of subordination when taking on 
the ways in which psychologies are collectively experienced. Is that a reasonable approximation? Reasonable. Okay, good. Um, last, I'm happy to introduce my friend and colleague Priscilla Ocean. Uh, Priscilla and I were actually both alumni of the UCLA Critical Race Studies Program, and so I was very blessed to be pre to be in her presence and present when she was. Uh, really doing a lot of things that were incredible in terms of shaping the landscape and consciousness in this law school. And she went on to become, uh, no small esteem, the Thurgood Marshall Fellow for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And there does an, an, a series of projects and is involved in a number of areas broadly related to critical race studies and specifically related to intersectionality, including a project that she'll be talking about in some more detail today on the subject of uh, women's prison reentry, particularly African Americans, women's prison reentry, and uh, the intersectional politics that complicate and make, inter and make reentry a particularly hazardous process. Um, so I'm going to say a few things uh, by way of introduction. I was originally asked to just speak on this panel and then took on the moderator role, but I'm going to keep my, com my comments comparatively short. Um, and then turn this discussion over to Ange Marie and subsequently to Liz and to Priscilla. Um, and we'll just proceed uh, without further introductions as we go. So when Ange Marie is done, Liz can proceed and then Priscilla. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is that one of the things that's very, very noteworthy about intersectionality is that it's extraordinarily popular in areas uh, that are very diverse in academia, philosophy, history, law, sociology, um, to some extent anthropology. It's certainly somewhat present in political science. Uh, thanks to the efforts of Liz Cole and others, it's, it's starting to make some strong forays in psychology. It's an enormous presence in women's studies. It's present in various areas of ethnic studies. And those of us in law can attest that that's fairly unusual. There are a few other examples where we can think of where a legal scholar um, has, has originated a concept or term that has proliferated so widely, but very few. And I'm not sure if there's any, in fact, I can't certainly think of any that um, have done that more so than the concept of intersectionality, as first posited by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's one of the founders of the critical race theory mo movement, and as folks know, uh, one of the leaders in our own critical race studies program at UCLA Law. So it's in some ways a blessing when a concept like intersectionality travels so widely as an adopted and is adopted in so many places. And for those of us who find that originating work stimulating, powerful, the word I like to use is oxygenating. It helps me breathe a little more clearly and a little deeper, thinking about the potentials of social change that I think are embedded in the work. And so in some ways it's, it's you know, a moment for celebration to think that intersectionality is something that's been embraced so widely and our expectation might be there must be just worlds of wonderful work and progress taking place as this, I would argue, very powerful concept has been adopted so widely. And there are moments when looking at intersectional research and instances where particular organizations or communities are, are actually implementing intersectional advocacy that, ver that very much validate that hope for me, that we're seeing intersectionality be part of a broader attempt to realize social change. Um, one of the things that also strikes me, though, and I, especially in the past year, have been more intensely reviewing the research on intersectionality and noting that it suffers from what we might think of as the telephone game, as it's moved across disciplines around the world, been interpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted. And so I've had the repeated experience of reading not just articles, but whole collections in which I'm, for instance, looking through a discussion of intersectionality in one author after another, and I'm like, there's no race here, right? This is a concept that came from critical race theory, and there's no race here, right? Um, or I had the, uh, you know, striking experience of, of reading intersectionality and coming away thinking if I didn't have a foundation in those originating works, I would think intersectionality was only about how people experience identity, how they talk about it, how they represent it, how they represent it, how identities are complicated in communities. I wouldn't know that it had any foundation, for instance, in a structural critique of an institution such as law, right, or whole social movements or social services as Crenshaw took on in Mapping the Margins. And so one of the things I want to note is that we've got kind of a blessing-curse dynamic. We've got a concept that's traveled widely and 
been uh, proliferated and been built on in ways that I think are profoundly needed and very exciting, been misunderstood, I think, with the best intentions, sometimes been misunderstood with less good intentions, um, and generally appropriated and used. And that's not unique to intersectionality. Part of that is just the beast that we call academia, right? You put an idea out there and it takes on a life of its own and you might meet it a year later and not recognize it, right? And so this is certainly a common dilemma. But when a concept is as popular and as resonant and as apparently adaptable as intersectionality is, I would say this is a very significant dynamic. So I want to just, before passing this on, talk about some of the ways in which I think that intersectionality is not only popular but charged. What's exciting, what's stimulating, what's a little bit threatening about it for people. Um, one of the points that uh, one of our counterparts in the UK has made, Gail Lewis, is that there's some anxiety as intersectionality has traveled around Europe, and I would say it's at least as diffuse and celebrated and employed there as it is in the United States about employing a theory that's grounded in the work originally of US black feminism generally and a US black feminist in particular. And so some of the time when I read, for instance, dialogues about intersectionality coming out of Europe, one of the things that strikes me is that there's a sense of there was this, you know, kind of basic foundational work done by this theorist who's kind of studying her own tiny, tiny, tiny little experience, right? And she came up with something, and it was a, you know, it was a starter. It was, it was good, and then it went to Europe and became a theory, right? Um, especially in France, you know, um, and and uh, and yeah, a few other regions, Germany. Um, and so one of the things that, and, and as it became a real theory, it, it certainly lost its connection to critical race theory because race is a very specific context that hasn't been so resonant or relevant in Europe since World War II, um, as certainly as it is in the United States. And so reading that kind of discourse, hearing that kind of discourse, and also hearing it validated certainly by European theorists, um, like our colleague uh, Gudrun Exeli Knapp, who's critiquing that dynamic in Germany, one of the things that struck me about it is that I think there's a tremendous value in, rec in recognizing and remembering the origins of intersectionality and critical race studies and critical race theory. Um, and there are other places in this program that I think will take up that challenge better than I could possibly do, but I just want to initially acknowledge it. And I want to say that I see a parallel domestic dynamic, and it struck me repeatedly as a sociologist reading um, my colleagues, many of whom I, whose work I value and benefit from tremendously in feminist sociology, and seeing this parallel worrying over the idea of what do we do with the theory if it comes from black feminism? Are we are allowed to talk about it if we're not black? Do we need to sanitize it first? Do we need to clean it up? Do we need to make it you know, brighter and newer and fresher and maybe whiter before we can? And engage it more thoroughly. Um, and so without intending to be overly critical, I want to acknowledge that part of the origin of intersectionality is both critical race studies and the way it's read against the identity of the people who created it and the person who coined the term. Um, the last things that I want to note are some of the ways I think intersectionality may commonly be misunderstood, at least relative to its origin. And I want to be clear here that because interpretations are subjective, because we get to apply and reinvent terms, and that's one of the privileges of academics and both a blessing and a curse, um, certainly I don't mean to say that there's a singular or correct meaning of intersectionality. But one of the things I note is that I'm reading people describing intersectionality and the, dis and the the discussion of its history and its context and so forth are often painted in very broad strokes and they're usually attributed back to Kimberly Crenshaw in a citation and many of the statements made um, will directly contradict things that I've read in her work. You know, so for instance, she'll be saying things about employment, about the need for engaging class further in intersectionality and I'll read something that says intersectionality doesn't let us talk about class, right? Um, and so one of the things that's really important is to say, you know, it's okay if this concept travels, and even if it's not okay, there's nothing we could possibly do about it. Mm -hmm. But we can remember where it's traveled from and think about, as we continue to reinvent and sometimes to blatantly appropriate, can we be intentional and conscious about what it is that we might want to choose to ally ourselves with or honor in those origins? And so I'll highlight three points very briefly because I'm already over my planned time. 
about the ways in which I think intersectionality is under, misunderstood. One, as I've already noted, is that it's also, it's often reduced to a conversation about identity. And it's also true that a lot of the discussions about intersectionality are doing that. And so then people will come along and critique it and say, intersectionality is not fully engaging structure. It's not helping us think about the ways in which racism and patriarchy, as opposed to the identities of individual people, um, are are truly intersecting and interacting at the level of economics, at the level of law, and so forth. And again, I want to say that certainly that's true of some of what's been done about intersectionality, but when you read intersectionality as a critique of legal doctrine of social services structure and review the originating concept in mapping, margins of, uh, in mapping the margins of structural intersectionality, there's a lot there to contest that idea. The second thing I want to notice is that intersectionality is sometimes reduced to either a theory or a method, and I would argue that it's not easily reducible to either any one of these categories, right? Sometimes when you're dealing with something as aggressively hostile as legal structures which insist that there is no such thing as an anti-discrimination claim for black women, right? To tackle that, you must simultaneously, if you are skilled enough to do so, right, invent a theory, a method, a tool. It won't be complete. It couldn't possibly. Right? But it will be the bones, the entry point, the foundation in which to build a broader theoretical field. And so I think it's important to understand that intersectionality was never fully developed, of course. It was never finished. But where it started was intended to engender all of those things. Theory, method, epistemology, practice, advocacy, uh, pedagogy, and so forth. And so forth. The last thing I want to do in my disciplinary, uh, in my points about disciplinary misreadings is note that I didn't understand Crenshaw's work nearly so well or some of her subsequent counterparts or some of her precedents um, in, broader, in broader scholarship both in the area of black feminism and uh, precedents to critical race theory until I had encountered them both in sociology and in law. Um, and that was really striking that I did not, and it wasn't just reading Crenshaw again, it was reading her after coming up against law as a law student, the monolith of law, the intractability of law, the ways in which it absolutely denies the, po the possibilities for stating the abundantly obvious, <laughs> or acknowledges that, <laughs> that the obvious exists, and then absolutely denies that there could be any way that law could solve problems that have been created, sometimes by law, right? So one of the things that was significant for me is that I understood what she was engaging better. And I don't think that you need to go to law school, thank goodness, as the costs of it rise, <laughs> um, in order to, to make good use of, of Crenshaw or any of her counterparts in critical race theory. But I'm going to acknowledge my colleague Bonnie Thornton Dill here pointed out, a lot of times as we read across disciplines, not only do we fu not fully understand the disciplinary context, but we don't know that we don't know. Right? It makes sense to us, right? We know what race means in activism. We know what race means in psychology. We know what race means in women's studies. And we don't have a foundation to know what race means in law. So we, so we misunderstand what was a particular author's engaging. Now, this is one of the reasons why conferences like this are urgent, because these interdisciplinary encounters help do that translation work. And I'm so far over my time. So the last thing I'll say is that um, I want to say that I'm going to do an unapologetic defense of both the cover of this program for our conference and Crenshaw's traffic metaphor, which I think has been repeatedly most grossly misunderstood of possibly anything she said. Um, and one of the things about the traffic metaphor is that, you know, you'd have to really dig into, first of all, what she originally said, read the text. Um, second, it would be helpful context to think about what was happening at the World Conference Against Racism where she started to advance the concept of the traffic metaphor more thoroughly. And third, that it's important to understand that the point of thinking about intersectionality as a point of impact, right, is not to say that outside that point of impact, Racism, patriarchy, capitalism, heterosexism, ableism, the entire and ever-growing and <laughs> malleable list of forms of intersecting for of subordinations that we encounter, they exist everywhere, right? They don't only exist at a point of impact, 
but to understand the experiences of intersectionality, intersectional vulnerability, we look at the points of impact. Where do these things collide to cause the deepest injuries? And we understand that, that patriarchy, for instance, is not a distinct street, right, which never met anywhere else. Now, I've never actually, you know, which never met capitalism street anywhere else, right, which never met white supremacy street or globalization street anywhere else, right, that they're all part of the field, the area, the playing field. I never actually asked Kimberly Crenshaw this question, right? Did when you meant when you said the trafficking, when you when you first engendered the trafficking metaphor, did you mean that outside of that intersection, uh, these things never connect? But I don't have to because I've read her work. So, and I don't mean this to come forth as simply um, a reclamation, for instance, or a defense of one of the originators of the term, but I want to be sure that I say to folks that one of the ways in which engaging intersectional research and practice is particularly fraught and complicated is that the ways in which it has traveled have so diverged from its originating agenda that we're a bit adrift in figuring out what we want to do with it. That is a perfect segue to get off my soapbox and <laughs> um, say that the three people here today are all folks that I was very, very excited and was in on the decision to include because I think that they're folks who are trying to solve that question, right? Trying to figure out what do we do with this? Cognizant of its past, thinking about its future, knowing that it's significant and important to, to us. How do we plow through the complexity of what the term has become and put it to use as that work? So I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Ange Marie Hancock. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, putting together this workshop um, within the symposium. Uh, the first thing, um, it was interesting you used the word oxygenating because the minute I kind of walked in, I felt like I could exhale because I knew I wasn't going to have to explain what intersectionality meant. Um, you when I, tell. <laughs> even though there are distinctions, I think there are certain people and certain things that we know that are associated with the term. Um, but then listening to Beth, I, I am now very cautious about how I define intersectionality. And so as a political scientist, um, I want to look at kind of how intersectionality has been translated in the world of political science and public policy more generally, which is kind of where my work has really focused. Um, and so when I talk about intersectionality to my fellow political scientists, and some of them are in here, uh, one of the things that we often have to say to people is that intersectionality does indeed, as Beth mentioned, refer to both a normative theoretical argument as well as an approach to conducting empirical research. So it is, again, just like black feminism starts off with, both and, not either or, right? So when we talk about that, um, this recognition of the th normative side of things, that it's a theory of intergroup relations um, that does not eschew the role of structural power from a relational perspective, um, has, again, been important in political science because it's what distinguishes it from what's traditionally called pluralism in political science, right? So this kind of Dahl type argument, Ronald, uh, Robert Dahl type of argument that says that groups can kind of interact and they kind of organically form and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And I think, you know, in from the world of law, Professor Lonnie Guineer has pretty much demolished the idea that sometimes you win and sometimes you lose and there's just <laughs> never any systematic kind of way in which that turns out repeatedly over and over again the same way, right? Um, so there has been a way of translating, what's interesting about that is that there has been a way of translating it into political science as a critique of pluralism in a very specific way, which has been helpful. Um, but again, for me, it goes beyond the theory towards an approach to conducting empirical research. Um, and what empirical scholars, at least the ones that I've been able to read, and I freely admit that I have never been able to read everything that has gone on in intersectionality research, um, what the ones that I've been able to read have focused on, has fo have focused upon, is intersectionality's use as what I call a justice-oriented analytical tool. Right. So if we think of intersectionality as a justice-oriented, so embracing the critique, embracing the foundation from which it came from, as a justice-oriented, how do we seek justice? How do we bring more justice, increase it in a variety of different ways? Um, how do we do that for policy research, policy design, and policy implementation? Right. 
So that's the way in which that I've kind of worked with intersectionality over the course of my now 15 years, I can't believe it, <laughs> in doing this kind of work. Um, so I want to move through a brief discussion, um, and hopefully this will, let's see, there we go. A brief discussion um, in my comments, and then hopefully in the Q&A, I have a couple of applications that we could talk about if we're interested. Um, in my comments, I want to talk about the evolution of paradigmatic intersectionality um, to kind of flesh out where I think the literature is going in political science and public policy. So I will definitely caveat and kind of bracket my comments to those disciplines with which I'm most familiar. Um, certainly, it's going on in a range of things, as we've seen and we will see over the next few days. Um, but again, in the applications, I think one of the things that I wanted to point, it at, point out with regard to intersectionality, at least from my perspective, has been that two of the central contributions of intersectionality have been this enhanced approach to complex causality. Right? And so we're going to define that as the idea that there is no single path to the same outcome. Okay. So we can talk more about how that might apply to something like early breast cancer diagnosis, meaning that if the desired outcome is that women and men get an early diagnosis, because early diagnosis is the best predictor of being able to survive breast cancer, we know that there are multiple paths to get to that early diagnosis. There's not just one single path. There's not one single magic bullet. So I think intersectionality helps us think about that. And I think the other central contribution, at least for me, and it does stem directly from what I think black feminism's contribution has been to intersectionality and to the world in general, which is to really kind of expand the way we think of solidarity and the way in which we think of coalition building in a very egalitarian kind of framework. So we've always had coalitions. We've always had alliances, um, something like the North American uh, NATO is definitely uh, what we might call an alliance, but I don't think we would call that an egalitarian alliance in many different ways. And so I think one of the unique contributions of black feminism has been to expand and through intersectionality really help us think through how to better build what I call deep political solidarity. Mm. So in terms of specifics, my work has focused, hopefully this will work, <laughs> on public policy making and the ways in which intersectionality theory can intervene in two different and distinct types of policy making literatures. So specifically, a couple of the questions I investigate break down into two different areas. Uh, first, the work that I've done most um, in the past 10 years has focused on the social construction of target populations literature. And they basically argue that who's at stake in policy making decisions matters. Now you may think, duh, of course the people matter. But again, in political science, sometimes it takes us a little longer to get to the idea that who's at stake matters as much as what's at stake. Um, and so which target population's behavior a specific policy seeks to alter is kind of the central kind of question with regard to the social constructions literature. And so most of us would agree that different groups are treated differently in public policy, e.g. differential sentencing for powder versus crack cocaine. Very clear example, right? But again, that literature has needed an intervention by intersectionality theorists to introduce the kind of complexity about who's at stake to better specify the decision-making process that the social construction literature wants to talk about. What's also been interesting to me is the way in which the policy literature can also help influence intersectionality. So over the past couple of years, I've been reading about a model that's called disproportionate information processing, which focuses on the idea that most governmental action is undertaken in what's called an information poor context, meaning that Congress does not necessarily know what the agencies are doing. They know what the agencies tell them, and that's not always the same as what the agencies are actually doing. That's kind of an information poor context, right? So by definition, government officials, both elected and bureaucratic, are making decisions that are reliant on signals, okay? What they hear in the media, what they hear from these test congressional uh, testimony, et cetera. So we don't know, for example, um, oh, excuse me. So by definition, they are relying on these signals. And this model, too, again, suffers from a lack of complexity in that the model itself focuses on the content of the messages. Right, so it focuses solely on what the bureaucratic official is telling the member of Congress and doesn't focus on the messenger, again. So one of the things I think that intersectionality can bring in is, again, this sense of complexity of who these messengers are. Right? 
So when we think about this, the way, in fact, we might integrate paradigmatic intersectionality into decision-making um, has to do with all stages of the policy process. So not just kind of once we've got a policy, what are the reports and the evaluation that we're hearing, but even at the design stage, the decision-making stage, so do we go with a public option or a single-payer system, for example, okay, um, implementation as well as evaluation. So the social construction of target populations literature, um, which was first put forth by Ann Schneider and Helen Ingram in 1993, focused on the idea that historical and contemporary policy designs have a long-term effect in that they identify target populations and allocate rewards and sanctions to them. No surprise to anyone here. These targets are also affected by many other aspects of policy design, such as rules, tools, rationales, and causal logic that explains how targets relate to the problem definition or the goals of the policy. And these policy designs, and this is the feedback arrow that's really important, especially when we're talking about intersectionality, the structural side of things, these policy designs also send messages back to those target populations, right? So if we require welfare recipients to work, Okay, welfare recipients are getting a clear message about the way in which they are thought of in Washington, for example, in 1996 during welfare reform. Okay, so it's not just that that message goes in one direction towards Congress or towards a state legislature. It goes back to those target populations as well. So there have been several critiques of Schneider and Ingram's theory that it was impermissibly vague, it was unwieldy for empirical research, and my critique has followed along these same kinds of lines. And so in 2004, I published The Politics of Disgust that really tried to bring in this kind of complexity of intersectionality. So one of the examples, just to give you an example of what Schneider and Ingram talked about, was that in this kind of positively constructed uh, but negatively or weak in power group, the dependents, Okay. One of the categories that they suggested that these people are positively constructed in the media and in stereotypes and in popular culture and political culture, but don't have a lot of power. Um, the example they came up with was mothers. And so if we bring an intersectionality critique to that idea, of course, we know that not all mothers are positively constructed in the U.S. context. Right. Certainly, if we think about the role of race, the role of class, those things play a significant portion. And more recently, since 1996, if we think about the way in which sexual orientation has also come into the popular lexicon in terms of who's an appropriate parent, right, we do need to bring intersectionality to this literature in a very significant way. So I did a little bit of that, but what I'm finding now is that there's a need for wholesale improvement um, and that what I call paradigmatic intersectionality rather than content intersectionality can perhaps better represent some of the complexity that we need to capture. So I will skip over this, just show it to you. Oh, sorry about that. Go previous? Yeah, okay. Um, because Beth has already covered the roots of intersectionality theory um, quite cogently. Um, and she's also offered a defense of the intersecting streets metaphor. <laughs> um, so I want to kind of skip to the benefits here, but also talk about the ways in which, again, um, there have been a lot of benefits of content intersectionality with regard to making the vis invisible visible, right? So when Crenshaw talks about this idea that there are certain claims that don't get recognized in a legal structure, that claim of invisibility, I think, is something that in political science people have very much talked about and really tried to remedy in a number of different ways. Um, and so it the benefit of content intersectionality is that it produces historically, politically, and socioeconomically specific information that can lead to as yet unexplored political coalitions as well as better informed public policy, of course. Right. My friend and colleague Andrea Simpson, who's in the room, has done this amazing work on black women in the environmental justice movement, for example, okay, that points out the way in which black women's leadership really has been invisible in the EJ movement in a lot of different ways, but has been central in many ways to some of the stunning victories that they've been able to obtain. So when we think about the benefit of content intersectionality, we certainly get that there's this idea of rendering the invisible visible that is extremely important in a lot of ways. 
But I also want to just articulate a couple of challenges that I've found in doing my work with this road metaphor. Um, and we've been in, in conferences and panels where we're like, well, are there just two roads? Is it two dimensions? Or how do we, you know, if we make this multidimensional, have you seen the fifth element? Can you think of the way in which that taxi <laughs> kind of weaves through the police? You know, all of this, we try to really visualize and struggle with this. And so I think rather than take that as a sign of, a, you know, a bad thing about the metaphor, it's really a sign of its vibrancy to still be arguing and thinking through that 15, 20, 21 years later. Um, but the challenge is that we found Around, um, my fellow political scientists and I. Um, the first one would be that, uh, as Rita DeMoon has argued, the rather arbitrary privileging among disciplines of race, class, gender generates a false, con uh, false companion assumption that the three function identically rather than making the ways in which each of them function an open empirical question. So when you're doing empirical research, you really do need to focus on the ways in which these might function very differently. Um, not just in different contexts, but differently from each other. Okay. So it seems like a rather idle point, but consider the way that CRT is often framed as doing critical legal studies, but with race, right? How critical race feminism is framed as doing CRT, but including gender, right? And so the question that hopefully we can kind of talk about today, um, and again, I make this not in the sense of you know, a huge critique, but more so as we really do need to think about this centrally is, what do we possibly miss right, about how race or gender or class function if we're taking the intersectional logic seriously? Right? How, what do we miss if we look for the same types of evidence simply because that's where it was located with the previous category? Right? So what if we just do the structure of class but use race, so we change the language and we say, yeah, it functions a little differently, but what are we missing because we're so grounded in CLS or we're so grounded in CRT? So it's almost taking your question and flipping it, right? So yes, we absolutely need to honor and privilege our existence uh, or our history, but also where might there be some blind spots based on that history in a lot of different ways? So one of the most common general critiques that's happened with regard to political science is, of course, that there are legions of other identities and categories beyond race, class, and gender, right, that we could absolutely include. So whether they're identities or categories of difference, whether they're marginalization processes, which is another way that it's been talked about in political science, we could include sexual orientation, disability, nation, national status, religion, any number of different categories. And so for a political scientist or an empirical researcher, simply expanding the metaphor to kind of a spokes on a wheel kind of diagram not only removes the visual intersection entirely, but ends up sacrificing parsimony. And if you do any kind of empirical research, there's a huge bias towards parsimony that you have to be attentive to when you start to think about how many more categories we could add in. So, not to mention that as DeMoon reminds us, and she's actually publishing an article in a symposium in Political Research Quarterly that will com be coming up next year, we can't a priori set a universal standard of which categories to include. So this is, again, part of the struggle with the traveling, right? So we're not happy, and I share Beth's uh, kind of consternation about the ways in which race drops out of many European kinds of analyses. But again, can we set a priori the universal standard that race should be a category included in all contexts, here and now, past and future, forevermore? Okay. I think if we're thinking about race in the modern context, I don't think we can necessarily set that as an a priori kind of universal standard that we want to impose. So if we can't do that, right, as upsetting and as kind of like hard for that, that may be, we have to think about, again, how do we include a certain set and not include every single category that could possibly be um, generated. And then last, and this is my own kind of characterization of a limit, uh, the metaphor doesn't explain where the road ends or begins. Um, and then again, going back to the, if we think of them as streets, implies that there are only two directions, backwards and forwards. And this is particularly important for me as I think about coalitions, right? That there might be a sideways that we want to think about in many different ways, that if you think about it as streets, at least for my students and the people that I work with a lot of times, they really do think of literal streets. And it's very difficult to kind of get them to think about you know, the, the emancipatory aspects in a lot of different ways. So when we think about this idea of the intersection as being streets, um, that the intersection is a static location of indivis invisibility for women of color. Um, that's how one colleague wanted to put it to me at a recent pa panel. 
I would argue instead that the intersection is a dynamic center of invisibility and hyper-visibility, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to get too Foucauldian on you or anything here, <laughs> but especially when we talk about public policy, when we're talking about welfare recipients, undocumented immigrants, prison populations, terror suspects, okay? All of the kinds of people that we have been focused upon representing better, right, based on the insights of intersectionality. Visibility is contingent and mediated by where, what I've elsewhere called the politics of disgust which involves a perversion of democratic attention, right? And a communicative context where the folks in charge have a far bigger microphone to construct a group than a group has to construct itself. And we have to contend with that in some very serious ways. So just moving on to wrap up, what we've seen in political science is that as we've kind of struggled with this idea of is it, con is it static or is it not static, um, we've actually focused on the idea that perhaps we do have to focus on processes in a lot of different ways. And perhaps we do need to really think about, instead of race, class, gender, think about these things as dynamic processes. And as you can see from the colors on the slide, that again, not only do they function differently, that's why they're different colors, but also that the connections between them might actually function differently, depending on which connections in which categories you're focusing on. So Mary Hawksworth in 2003 published an article called Congressional Enactments of Race and Gender that absolutely kind of focused on this kind of approach. So where do we end up? Where do I think we're going right now, um, and scholars like Leslie McCall have um, kind of started this kind of trend, um, we focused our attention instead of on content categories, so should we include race or should we include gender or should we include class, to think about, again, what are the conceptual relationships between the categories or between the processes that we want to focus on, right? So I tell people often, we may not know in 300 years. We'd like to think we know, but, you know, again, professors and lawyers, we generally don't, okay? We like to think we know what, where every, what categories are going to matter in 300 years. Okay, But in fact, we don't. And so what we can say from a paradigmatic intersectionality perspective is that there are conceptual relationships between whatever those categories are in 300 years that we should still pay attention to. So we are still going to know that categorical multiplicity, that more than one category, is likely going to matter. We're still going to know that the intersection of those categories is going to matter. Okay. But what we're also going to know is that there is diversity within those categories from a socio-politically and socio-economically perspective, and that we need to be attentive to time dynamics, both across time, meaning that what it meant to be black in 1892 is very different from what it means to be black in 2010. Again, sounds like a duh thing, but we do need to make sure that we incorporate that in our empirical research. And for survey research, it's particularly difficult to do so. So to conclude, oh, sorry, go back one here. I do think that there are four benefits for political scientists and people who are active in politics to the intersectional model. I think one that has been understudied, but I think will emerge as probably the one that we need to focus on in the 21st century, is going to be the recognition of how individuals and groups experience both privilege and oppression within a single socially constructed system. Right? So if we do get to the discussion of Proposition 8, I think that will come out quite clearly. Okay? Second, that the intersectional model overcomes the tendency to emphasize individualist analyses. So as you saw on that last slide, there was a, a section called individual institutional relations. So that we think of the ways in which individuals and institutions co-create race, class, gender, or any other category that we might be thinking of. Now, for empiric empiricists, that's really hard to think about how could we construct a multi-level variable of race, for example, right? that goes beyond just asking people, how do you identify? So it is difficult, but it is not impossible, and we have to focus on that. And then last but not least, the two that I began with um, at the beginning of my presentation, intersectionality turns our attention towards counterintuitive coalitions and encourages a specific way of standing in solidarity. And then finally, it allows us to address the causal complexity. And I think, again, those are going to be the important things that, at least in political science and public policy, we're going to be turning towards uh, for the rest of the century. Thanks. Okay, thank you.
Well, I would also like to speak um, from my disciplinary perspective as a psychologist. Um, and although I am affiliated with the Department of Psychology, the major part of my appointment is in women's studies, and I think that's where most of my professional identity is right now. Um, <laughs> as will become clear as I speak. Um, but when I started out grad school, I started out in clinical psychology, and I ended up leaving that field because I was really frustrated with what I saw as um, an insistence that people's problems ought to be understood as being rooted in sort of their um, individual personalities and kind of their decontextualized backgrounds. Um, that was just not an acceptable way of understanding the world um, to my view. And so I went into research psychology. Um, and after studying there for many years, ironically, I saw a pattern that was in some ways similar to what I saw going on in clinical. So even though in research psychology I saw examples of um, psychologists being interested in categories like race and gender, um, they often treated them in a way that was sort of similarly decontextualized. So they saw these social categories as basically describing different kinds of people. And there was sort of a pervasive tendency to do group comparisons in a way that was kind of under-theorized, like let's just compare men and women and see how they're different. Um, or <laughs> treating, um, very, treating race and gender and social categories as variables that could be controlled for. So this is the relationship between two variables if you hold gender constant, like people don't have a gender. Um, those, those were uh, approaches to understanding these um, concepts that seemed really important to me that were just um, limited and not explanatory and um, decontextualized from the real structural importance of those concepts. So rather than seeing race, gender, and other kinds of social categories as created through historically rooted social practices that importantly result in inequality and that change over time, there just seemed to be the similar insistence of treating them as variables that were decontextualized. And as I was putting this together, I was reminded of something that one of my mentors used to say. If you can get people to ask the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what the answer is. Okay? So I feel like when you treat um, these categories as variables without asking what do those categories mean, you're asking the wrong questions. So my interest in intersectionality was not just motivated by my own identity as a woman of color, but it was also um, in important to me as a way to, um, a way out of this limitation, a way of thinking about how these categories that I call categories of identity, difference, and disadvantage depend upon one another for meaning, right? Um, and by thinking of these variables in this way, or by thinking of these constructs in this way instead of as um, sort of simplified variables, I felt like we had a better chance at understanding what they mean and how they function in people's lives. Um, Professor Hancock has argued that intersectionality is not just a content area, it's a paradigm, and I think that's really useful. But I think as we think about how it's going to travel into different disciplines, we have to also think about the ways that the conventional ways we use empirical methods also implies a paradigm. And so if we're working in these traditional disciplines and we're serious about intersectionality, I think we have sort of two um, tasks before us. So one is finding ways to um, incorporate an intersexual perspective into our work, but we also need to think about the ways that um, articulating an intersexual perspective into our research would change the whole field, right? How would psychology look different if we took seriously the challenge of using an intersectional lens? Now, one aspect of the um, paradigm in psychology that I think sort of has contributed to this tendency to see race and gender and other social categories in this oversimplified way is the practice of null hypothesis testing, where you compare two groups to each other, and if you find a difference, then that reflects some kind of innate or essential difference between the two groups, and that doesn't compel um, sort of deeper structural ways of thinking about what those categories mean. So sort of the whole enterprise of testing our questions by looking for difference reifies the belief in difference. and. Um, does not always sort of shed light on what those categories mean. So one way that I've tried to bring an intersectional perspective to psychology is to challenge that um, null hypothesis testing um, 
paradigm by thinking in terms of similarity, okay? And in this, I've been very influenced by Kathy Cohen's paper mm -hmm. on punks, bulldaggers, and welfare queens, where she's saying that if we think structurally, we should not always expect differences between groups, but we should also notice places where similarity and oppression generate similarities and outcomes. And that by thinking that way, we start to notice the ways that racism, heteronormativity, um, sexism are interlocking systems that cut across conventional identity groups. Um, and so what I want to talk to you about today is largely based on a paper that I published in Sex Roles in 2008. Um, and in it I tried to do something that I think was um, pretty unusual in psychology. Instead of trying to talk about how psychologists ought to do their work by looking at what other psychologists have done, um, I started with a series of interviews that a group of us at Michigan did with feminist activists and um, called the Global Feminisms Project. And this was a project in which um, organizations in four different countries tried to put together a database of oral histories with feminist activists that would represent feminist work in those countries. And I worked on the U.S. site where we chose intersectionality as sort of the framework because we felt like there was a very conventional narrative of um, feminist activism that had been sort of done to death in the US and we wanted to tell a different story. So what I did in this sex roles paper was I looked at the ways that these activists and their narratives were talking about how they had overcome intersectional problems to build coalitions and then I tried to sort of think out loud about how those insights could help us do psychology differently too by thinking about practical ways to think more structurally about these categories rather than sort of limiting them to an individual level or sort of a null hypothesis level or a level that's focused on um, identity as Beth mm -hmm. pointed out which I think psychology is very guilty of. Um, yes, and rightly so. So what I'd like to talk about a little bit now is three things that I observed from these interviews with activists that I think could be sort of lessons for our approach to um, thinking about uh, re intersectional research, especially in psychology, but probably also in um, other social scientists. One of the things that we noticed is that the activist narratives highlighted the differences within their groups and the real everyday work it took to navigate them, even among groups that would appear homogeneous. So um, one woman who had worked with a group of um, Palestinian women talked about he, how even defining what it meant to be a Palestinian woman became grounds of contention within her group. So did it mean that you had to be born there? Did it, could you be an immigrant? Did it mean that... Um, what about women who were not of Palestinian origin, who were married to Palestinian men? Um, talking about the um, differences, internal differences within that group and the political work they had to do to overcome them really, I think, highlights the way that there are very few natural allies. And um, I was just at a session where Anna Karastathis, who's giving the other session next door, um, really spent time kind of investigating in depth um, uh, a small paragraph at the end of um, Crenshaw's article on um, it's demarginalizing, no it's it's the one on um, domestic violence and she talks about how at the end Snapping the margins, right. She talks about how at the end, even a group like African Americans could be understood as a coalition between men and women. Um, and so Anna as a philosopher, um, went into that in a really useful and helpful way. Um, but I think that thinking, noticing the differences within groups and the political work that keeps them together is um, a it's something different than just paying attention to neglected groups. It's also attending to how any given social category is constructed through its relations to other categories. And this was put very well by Wong, who observed that the use of categories such as, say, black, keeps us from seeing how class mobility, gender differences, or sexual orientation have altered the collective black experience. Okay. So what does that mean for doing research in psychology? I think it means that any time we're attempting to treat a particular group as representing um, a single identity group, we kind of um, ignore differences within that group at our interpretive peril. And I think a really good example was done by my colleague Ram Mahalingam, who um, looked at immigrant women from two different Asian countries. Um, he looked at women who were um, mail order brides, and he looked at women, immigrant women in the U.S. who were um, computer programmers. And even though they had um, very different histories and very different sort of cultural contexts, 
he found some really interesting um, similarities between them. So both groups contrasted their values and behaviors with white women who they viewed as sexually promiscuous, lacking family values, and corrupted by feminism. And they argued that both these groups were creating idealized gendered immigrant or identities as a reaction to an advance against the denigration and subordination they experienced as immigrants to the U.S. And what I think is really interesting here, it's sort of similar to what you're saying about multiple paths to the same outcome, is they were not arguing that there's some pan-Asian American gendered identity that both groups were experiencing, but there was something important about their um, structural experience of racism here in the U.S. that led them to the same place. Um, and so I feel like that study um, really illuminated how race and gender and immigrate, immigrant status were working in similar ways for two very different groups without sort of collapsing them into one group or saying this is the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the kind of thing that um, noticing the differences can give us a richer and better understanding and that to overlook them might be more parsimonious, but it's a kind of false economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the second thing that I noticed from looking at these interviews is that we need to resist the impulse to normalize dominant identities. And I think that this is something we're especially um, guilty of within psychology. So when we treat social categories primarily as defining groups who have a difference that's a testable hypothesis, we sort of fall back on the idea that, well then, if the two groups score the same, then they must be the same, right? Um, that, that's the default. And um, I think that's terribly um, problematic. It decontextualizes the meaning of the categories. And it also um, sort of erases the dynamics of power and politics that construct those categories. And part of why I think that we are so guilty of this in psychology and it's so dangerous um, lies in measurement. And actually, I'm going to talk more about this at my session tomorrow. But um, in psychology, we spend a lot of time developing measures, testing them on large um, samples multiple times to make sure that they're internally consistent, to make sure that they have validity. And we use usually do that on pretty convenient and homogeneous samples, right? So undergraduates. Um, and so what that means is that we've spent a lot of time and effort developing these measures that we know work well for one population, but then those measures become reified as what um, as the sort of true test of whatever it is we're trying to study. So I've um, accumulated sort of a critical mass of students who are all interested in studying body image, and it's really egregious in that literature. So the, all the conventional measures of body image, for example, seem to um, really highlight the body image concerns of young, white, mostly heterosexual women. So there's a big emphasis on um, the desire for thinness. And as a result, there's also a big literature that says that black women are so happy with their bodies compared to white women. But they're not even asking about aspects of the body that black women might be concerned about. And when women have done focus groups and other kinds of um, interpretive um, work with black women, they find that there's a great deal of body set dissatisfaction, but it's not the stuff that shows up on questions about how much time do you think about dieting and counting calories, right? Um, so in that example, not only are we sort of um, saying that white, young white women's body concerns are what body concerns are, um, we're also coming away with the idea that we don't have to worry about body image among women of color or among women who are not heterosexual or of, of women who are poor. Um, so I think, and then we're saying that this has been validated by looking at tested and um, tested scales whose validity is known. So this is a great example of how failing to take an intersectional approach is really poor science. And um, I wrote over here on the shuttle with one of my former students, Tiffany Griffin, who told me she's writing a review article on this right now. Um, so I think when we think about it this way, we see that it's not just a woman of color who had an idea about her specific group, that the failure to recognize this uh, diversity within categories is um, really a threat to any kind of claim of validity. Mm -hmm. Then finally, um, the third thing I want to talk about is that uh, listening to the activists made it clear that we need to think about these social categories not only as identities or characteristic of individuals, but also in terms of individual and institutional practices that create the categories, and that they're um, implicitly all about power and inequality. And here I want to make a plug for a paper by Aida Hurtado that she published in Science in 1989. Um, and um, often when I hear sort of the foundational 
uh, intersectional literature cited, this paper's missing. And I think that it's so important because in it she talks about differences between um, black women and white women that she links to their different relationships to white men. Okay, so it's not just that they're different because they're both women but they have two different races, is that they've got structurally different relationships to the group with the most power. And then she shows how this can create all kinds of um, expectable hypotheses about their ability to form coalitions, their um, ability to work together, their sort of um, different attitudes towards making social change. And we saw this in our interviews with the activists as well, um, especially because many of them were representing groups that were small constituencies. It was a practical problem that they had to identify common interests so they could work with other groups. So in that move, they were moving away from an identity politics towards looking for um, commonalities with other groups in terms of social structure. And I think that one of the things that this can remind us is the importance of studying dominant groups intersectionally. And um, some psychologists are doing really good work in whiteness studies that um, highlight actually ways that we could see, say, white working class men as having important common interests with um, other poor and working class people that these white working class men themselves do not experience or recognize. And here I'm thinking a lot of the work by Michelle Fine and Lois Weiss. Um, oops, excuse me. Um, so I'm being told that it's about time to wrap up. Um, so let me just say a few things to conclude what I've been talking about. Um, I think for psychologists, really what we need to do is figure out how can we think about differences and similarities across groups without resorting to essentialism, false universalism, or a kind of obliviousness to historical and contemporary patterns of inequality. I feel like this whole idea of thinking of race and gender as variables that can be measured in a sort of straightforward, untheorized way works against our ability to do that. And I think that by looking at what activists have told us about building coalitions across diverse groups, um, it becomes really clear that if we're going to understand these categories structurally, we're going to have to think about similarity as well. Also, as psychologists, I think we need to use political intersectionality to think of race and gender as social processes. They're not just things that we are, they're things that we do. And, um, and by doing this, we can see similarities that cross-cut identity groups. Um, now, I have argued elsewhere, and we can talk about this if you want to, that I don't think that this requires a methodological shift. I can point to great examples, even using experiments, classical experimental methods, that take an intersectional framework and still allow us to sort of shift our um, way of thinking about these categories to a way that's more informative, more useful, and more valid. Um, but I think that the difficulty here is that it's going to mean that psychologists need to be better social scientists and need to have a better and kind of more um, interdisciplinary understanding of the social categories that they study. But as I mentioned before, I think that we don't have a choice about doing that. I think to the extent we don't do that, we misrepresent what these categories mean. Thank you. First, let me say thank you so much to the organizers and uh, of, the, of the symposium and uh, Beth in particular for uh, bringing together these two concepts of research and uh, practice because they're so critically important. Uh, and in particular, obviously, uh, given the, the, the theme of the symposium in, in, in intersectionality. Um, intersectionality is important as a theory because it grows out of the lived experience of people who have been rendered invisible uh, or have fallen into, into the void of various discourses, in particular around race, gender, class. Uh, so it's, imp it's important now as we're shifting the discussion from research to practice to figure out, at least for me and in, in my comments, how the theory can now speak back to those communities and say how can we shape the experiences that we have collectively and how can we shape, re how can we shape remedies, legal remedies and policy remedies. Uh, and, and for me personally, uh, it's really uh, an honor to be on, on a panel uh, during a symposium that's honoring the work of one of my, uh, a person I'm, I'm uh, very fortunate to call a friend and mentor, uh, Professor Crenshaw. Uh, her work has helped me to grow as a practitioner and it's helped me to, uh, help to equip me with, and, and others uh, who are in this room as well, 
uh, with the tools to begin to deconstruct the complicated um, uh, the, the complicated oppression that faces the, and that impacts black women uh, daily. Uh, and the need for these, these tools couldn't be more urgent. Um, black women have and continue to be primary targets of government control, uh, the control of their reproductive capacities, the right to maintain their families, the ability to find meaningful employment, secure safe and affordable housing, and increasingly to the right to their very liberty. Uh, and, and for me, that's going to be the, the point, point of my, uh, uh, dep uh, the departure of my comments. A as we all know, uh, that black women have been so targeted is not an accident of history, nor does it occur in a vacuum. Um, they are a target uh, as a result, as Professor Crenshaw has noted, of longstanding uh, historical, social, and cultural devaluation. Uh, indeed, as, as Dorothy Roberts observed, uh, this, this devaluation of black women uh, occurs as a result of the complex interaction, as I said, of race, gender, class, and a host of other uh, sort of identity uh, categories. And, and they're, they're more than the sum of their parts. And while there are multiple examples of, of this in my work, um, nowhere has this, the, this, this intersectional domination of black women uh, and the need for inter intersectional interventions been more clear uh, and pressing than in the context of incarceration. Um, now, let me sort of just, for folks who aren't as familiar with what's going on with black women and incarceration, and Beth mentioned briefly uh, that my work with the Lawyers Committee has been around developing a project targeting um, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated black women. Let me just sort of paint the picture, because part of the, the intervention is is making uh, as, as one of the other, as I think Andre Marie said, making the, invi the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. And often black women are invisible in conversations around mass incarceration. So let me just paint the picture. Let me, let me show you a little visible, visual here. Um, over the last three decades, uh, the incarceration statistics for African American women uh, have just been staggering. Um, nationwide, the percentage of African American women uh, incarcerated uh, over the last three decades has increased by over 800 percent. Thank you. I'm glad I got the reaction. 800 percent. Um, this is twice the rate for for uh, women generally. Um, African American women are 4.5 times more likely than white women to be incarcerated. Um, and this is this is nationally again. African American women in California. Uh, face similar disparities in incarceration rates. In California, here in this state, we house one of the largest number of women prisoners in the country. African American women constitute approximately half of the prison population, despite being only 7% of the population. Now, much of the growth in the African American uh, female population in our prisons can be attributed to two, two phenomena that also impact uh, men generally and, and black men in particular. Uh, sharp cuts to our collective uh, safety net and the harsh uh, sentences um, that have been doled out as part of the war on uh, drugs. But, but unlike men, there are a set of circumstances that have rendered black women more susceptible to incarceration as a result of some of these intersectional dynamics that have been discussed. For example, uh, African American women are more likely than men to have been the victim of physical or sexual abuse before the age of 18, uh, be unemployed at the time of their incarceration, undereducated, suffer from severe drug addiction, have mental illness, and suffer from and, and serve as primary caregivers from, from, for young children. And again, these are as a result of these broader intersectional domination that occurs with black women, and, and we need to talk about them when we're thinking about political and legal remedies. Um, often black women are unable to access necessary resources for treatment, um, and their crimes are born out of necessity oftentimes. They're nonviolent, often, like I said, drug offenses. Um, and let me also point out, just as a comparison, that the only category that black women are not overrepresented in is in probation. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, of, the women, of the number of women on probation, 62% are white, 27% are black, 10% are uh, Latino or Latina, 
and then there's uh, sort of the rest of uh, the, the folks remaining. Um, so, so you can see that white women are more likely to be given probation, which is non-custodial, than any other group in the system. Uh, so we can see that there's something going on here, right? There's something going on, and, and it's, and, but it requires a particular type of intersectional analysis to be able to see these dynamics and not just sort of gloss over them. But I also, I don't just want to talk about what's going on with women who are incarcerated. I also want to talk about some of the impacts of this. So not only have African-American women been disparately impacted by mass incarceration, so have their children. Uh, I work in San Francisco. And in San Francisco alone, over two-thirds of the kids in foster care are African-American. And again, San, in San Francisco, black folks are only 7% of the population. Um, and uh, many of these kids are in foster care as a result of their family members, or their mothers in particular, being incarcerated. Uh, so again, the, the extent to which mass incarceration impacting black women has tentacles that go beyond just the woman in, 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 in touches their children and the extended community is, it can't be uh, overstated. I can go on to talk about a, the, different federal policies that then make it easier for women to lose their parental rights. Uh, there's a federal policy that sort of fast tracks <coughs> uh, kids that are in the foster care system for adoption. There's a 22 month window uh, for, for children, for infants, it's about 14 months uh, in terms of adoption. But one of the things that's interesting is that the average sentence for black women is above 14 months. So many of the women that are incarcerated are losing their children as a consequence of incarceration. I also want to note uh, employment issues when women are released. Mm -hmm. Black women, uh, and this, 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 uh, this statistics, this, this, this finding comes from a study that was done, the first that I've read of its kind, uh, by the Felton Henderson Center at UC Berkeley. Black women uh, are the, the most disadvantaged. Formerly incarcerated black women are the most disadvantaged when seeking employment as compared to any other um, racial group, formerly incarcerated racial group. And the inter other interesting thing that was found in the study is that black women without um, criminal convictions had the same sort of callback rate in this audit study. So there was no advantage to having a, uh, not having a criminal conviction for black women. Uh, so again, these sorts of, this, this sort of information aggregation is an intersectional project in and of itself. Because in conversations, again, around, around mass incarceration, we talk about the black community, but the experience that is elevated is that of black men. Um, now despite the sort of what I've laid out for you and the compelling reasons why we need to have uh, more targeted legal remedies for black women and legal programs and policy remedies for black women, uh, I found, um, and this is all sort of based on my sort of anecdotal uh, experience, that the advocacy, the legal policy and grassroots advocacy communities generally, and there are notable uh, exceptions to this, fail to address the intersectionality of the particular type of subordination facing black women. In, in the context of incarceration, despite the fact, despite the observations of, of, of Professor Kimberly Crenshaw and others, there hasn't been a real strong move to engage these questions particularly and with specificity. Now I want to highlight just a few examples of this. Recently there was a, uh, and I want to talk about some of the causes also, I, and I, I don't want to suggest that there are folks who don't want to do this, but there are structural uh, barriers that I want to talk about that make it difficult to engage in the type of intersectional analysis and the intersectional interventions that are necessary. So let me start first with the legal piece, which is sort of my background in training. Uh, just last year, there was a case that was decided uh, by a court of appeals out, uh, let's see, the Eighth Circuit. It was around shackling of pregnant women uh, in prison. Uh, the plaintiff in that case was named uh, Shawana uh, Nelson. Her ra the, the race of the woman who was shackled was never mentioned. This despite the fact that we know that black women in, in countless studies are more likely than any other group of incarcerated women to be shackled during childbirth. 
but the race of the particular plaintiff in this case was not mentioned. And I think this goes back to the point that Beth was making about the erasure of women of color, and in particular black women, that continues in, in, in legal theory, in legal doctrine, and in our case law. And it hamstrings the ability of practitioners to then frame legal arguments that speak to the reality impacting black women. So in framing a claim, I'm sure the, the, the litigants, the folks who represented uh, Ms. Nelson, would have liked to talk, or maybe they would have liked to talk about uh, the fact that black women, as, as a group, uh, are more impacted by this and ought to be able to raise a claim, but that's not a cognizable claim in, in, in the context of prisons. So those sorts of, ham th those sorts of barriers uh, hamstrings our ability to really engage some of these, quest these questions meaningfully and in an intersectional manner. Uh, secondly, I also want to talk about just community dynamics. As we've talked about and rolled out this project around black women and reentry, I, I was surprised with the, the amount of resistance we got. Uh, the, the first reaction that, that I got when I told uh, someone when we started talking about this with partners was, why are you focusing on black women? Black men are the issue. Black men are the issue. Black men are, you know, and, and, and the, the conversation went from there. Uh, the community resistance to engaging in, in intersectional interventions is tremendous, which speaks to the need for intersectional framework, intersectional frameworks, intersectional dialogues, and challenging our communities around how we deal with each other in terms of some of the, the issues that were raised around how do we see the black community? Do we see it as a coalition between men and women? Do we, do we see, how do we see ourselves? And who are we, whose experiences are we privileging within uh, the various issues impacting the black community? So, so that was a, a, another significant barrier to the application of uh, an intersectional project. Um, and the third, the, another that's, that's huge is funding. Uh, funders often have privileged the, you know, have different priorities, and they, they are also not uh, intersectional. So different funders may have a black, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, just putting it, you know, they're, they're not, none of these are intersectional, okay? Uh, so there are projects focusing on black men and boys. There are not a lot of areas where we can tap into funding to focus on uh, black girls and women. So again, all of these, so we have the tremendous problems. We have the tremendous uh, intersectional uh, domination that occurs with black women, but we have a silence. That hams, we have a silence in, in legal jurisprudence, we have a silence in our communities, and we have a silence in terms of folks who have the resources to support the work. Uh, and this creates sort of a, fee, a, a feedback loop. But nevertheless, there are folks that are out doing the work. The Lawyers Committee has created this project. We're going forward. We're working with the African American Policy Forum and a number of other groups, including Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, that notwithstanding these challenges are going forward because of the tremendous um, issues and the tremendous opportunities that we have to create change in our communities. So part of what we're doing is creating learning circles where, where we're laying out all of this information, where we're making it available in uh, more digestible ways for our, 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 the folks that we work with. Um, we're also looking at particular legal strategies uh, and policy, uh, policies that we're, we're working with in terms of legislators uh, dealing with issues around shackling and make, privileging uh, and raising up the experience of black women in prisons and outside of prisons. Um, and we're also targeting our legal resources to the areas where black women are most directly impacted. And the Lawyers Committee I, I, is not alone, and, and we're not uh, alone in terms of our capacity to do this. We just need to make sure that we get this, this, this theory. We need to be able to articulate it and translate it in a way that's compelling, and we need to make it speak back to our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you so much, and I hope to hear back from you all about how to make the work more effective. So that was a very powerful and um, 
uh, gripping transitional point. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, so you all were here and you heard this. So there are times when you're moderating a session and you have a need to help people sort of bring together what it is they heard collectively. And there are times where you can just assume the audience was here and they knew it was great. Um, and so I'll, I'll uh, contain my feedback to thank you. It's a privilege to be in the conversation. Um, and given that our time is very limited, I'm going to cut a little bit of what we planned in the aftermath and just invite the panelists to speak to each other, um, to say anything you'd like to say responsively um, or to question or to bring up about what we've all talked about. And then quickly, I promise, we'll open it up to the audience for dialogue and Q&A. <laughs> all right, so then we'll proceed to the crucial part. Um, and go ahead. Oh, that's right. Uh, did you want the PowerPoint back up? Okay, sure. Um, so we'll go ahead and proceed now to question and answer. And we have mics on either side of the room, and I'll call on you to come. Thank you. Uh, okay, from here is fine too. Just speak up for us. Speak. Yeah, I'm really loud. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Um, I just want to put this out to everybody in the room and the panelists. Uh, Aunt Marie is, is a great, I, I admire her greatly, and I think we have like a mutual fan club. Uh, but I'm Aunt Marie, so it's the University of Richmond. Um, I really want us all to think about this idea of the differences in categories that you mentioned, Aunt Marie. That's so frustrating to me in political science that, you know, you know that we are actually being challenged about well, how many categories are we including what we're leaving out when we're putting in and I want to submit that not all the categories should be equally considered. And I went to an intersectionality conference at American University in which not a single panelist mentioned race. I'm not kidding you. We had a presentation on the activism of white women in rural areas, so the intersectionality was white, female, and rural. There was no mention of Professor Crenshaw at all in any of the literature reviews. But it was called an intersectionality conference. So it was quite uh, uncomfortable uh, after we got through and I expressed myself as I'm doing here. But I would say I might have had just a little more steam in it. Um, and you know, I got a notice of poly and all this, but it, it alarmed me because I could see a trend. And a lot of these people submitted some of these papers and they were published. Because, I mean, we can, we can get down to people who wear glasses versus people who wear contacts. And people who have short hair and who are losing their hair as I am, and I blame the Academy for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but am I really, I mean, if I were to, and I, is that a category? I don't know. You know, it means that I have a weakness in terms of my sight. No, well, it's clearly I'm not disabled. So, I mean, it's just, it's just, and I, I really wish we'd think more about what we're going to accept. As, as a category of, uh, of challenge, shall we say. I don't want to say uh, disempowerment, because everybody knows in the session this morning when I presented, I got a real problem with the, the disempowering nature sometimes of intersectional dialogues. But I really wish we'd all think about maybe a little more structure to when you have a genuine intersectional uh, research project and when you don't. OK. And, um, and I wanted to say, I was, I was in the show too, uh, it was uh, this morning coming from a hotel. But I teach a course about um, uh, money, policies, and prison. And to you, uh, um, professor, or just a you know, professor? You can call me attorney, Priscilla. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> attorney P. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I teach this course, and what's kind of amusing to me, not, well, not, it's not really amusing, it's really sad. Mm -hmm. I say amusing. If I don't laugh, I will cry. Um, I think the black community wants to focus on black men and some kind of effort to sort of um, create the same patriarchal system that it seems to me that we already know is not very really good. So for some reason, we're driven to focus on men. And if, if you want to see that, I hate to blow my own horn. I rarely do. But I did write a piece for perspectives on African American politics edited by Rupert Rich in which I talk about grassroots activists versus, you know, traditional black organizations. And I have to say, I'm apologize to all the Greek uh, members of traditional black Greek organizations, because I slammed you pretty bad. Links, 
Incorporated, Jack and Jill, they all get the hammer. Uh, because their agendas do not resemble at all the agendas of grassroots women. So one of my arguments in the piece is that, you know, we are not, certainly not monolithic in the black community, but can you imagine a black female organization like The Link in Los Angeles, who gave away one year like $100,000 in college scholarships all to men? I mean, I found that astounding. So that's a, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I hate to only, cut off. Yeah, not only organizations would say, but do you see what I'm saying? I think as a black community, mm -hmm. especially middle class, upper class professionals, we're seeking to, and they even have a statement about why they do it. Because they're trying to uh, create marriageable men <laughs> for young black women and sort of recreate this, um, this mm -hmm. myth that probably hasn't really existed in the white community. Okay. Of the perfect man and, and, and woman, and you know, two point five children in the garage, and yeah, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, you might look at that for. Oh no, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I, I think you're absolutely. I'm saying absolutely, you're, you're right. Um, I think that the, 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 the reaction to want to focus on men is, the follow-up to that is they're, they, establishing black men will reestablish our communities. That's yes. why we need to focus there. Yes. Where, which implies that black women, that, that would not be the, 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 the consequence, uh, that, that black women don't contribute just as much as black men to the stability of our communities, right? So I, I absolutely think that that is driving um, one of the reasons um, that drives the, the reaction to say, you know, we don't need to be focusing on uh, black women, even some small divergence of resources. I mean, most uh, most organizations that do reentry, the most of the clientele are, are men. Um, so to say we're going to take a small piece of that, those resources, and try to make sure that the needs of black women are met, even still, there's a strong reaction against that. And I think precisely for the reasons that you're, you're describing. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we, well, we've got two right next to each other, so can we go left, uh, to my left and then to my right? Yeah. Yes, you. Should we go to <laughs> the mic? Oh, I'm sorry, microphone, yeah. yeah. Let's, um, well, let's go ahead with these two, then mic, okay. and then we'll go like that. Thank you. Why don't you go to the mic so we can... Oh, yeah. okay. So can Thank you. Um, can um, you speak question, pretty loudly? Yeah, this okay. question is for, is for Professor Cole. Um, I'm wondering if you can please speak more about the, what you call, I guess, the doing conventional Okay, great question. Um, one example that I found that I thought was really impressive was a study by Margaret Shi, and um, she was trying to understand whether Asian American women um, were vulnerable to stereotype threat around math ability. And they're sort of an interesting example because they're stereotyped as bad at math by virtue of being women, but good at math by virtue of being Asian, right? Um, and so what she found is that depending which identity you primed, they kind of lived up or down to the stereotype. But then she did the same experiment in I think it was Vancouver where she said that the stereotypes about Asians and math ability were different and she didn't find that effect. And what I thought was so impressive about that was she was thinking about race as something that's constructed differently in different places, right, and making different hypotheses that she then tested with an experiment. And so I think that's a great example of how asking intersectional questions is about how do you conceptualize um, how these categories work. It's not necessarily in the methods. Now, I want to also say I think there's been a lot of experimental research that does not take that kind of care to think about how do the categories work and what do they mean and how might they be different in different places. So I'm not saying anything goes, but I, I'm saying it's not the method that determines whether a study is taking an intersectional approach. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Then we had one here, if you can speak. If, if folks can head towards the mic if you're able, that's great. Um, that'll be helpful. If you want to talk from there, but from here on, thanks. Go ahead. My name is Lance McCready. I'm from the University of 
enables us to sort of sort of move forward or come interested. So what was an intersectional analysis of the incarceration of black men and um and women? And is that interested on kind of Professor Colbert saying like what are the similarities that are going on there, but what are the differences, or is that useful? I'm, for me, it's, I, I'm kind of interested in sort of the full literature on the troubles of black boys, and I've been trying to use intersectionality to kind of look at that mm -hmm. in a pro-feminist way that mm -hmm. doesn't need to, but it's, I'm really troubled or have issues with that. I don't even feel very ambivalent about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is, just um, um, in working in the Canadian context, issues of diaspora and migration are really important, and I'm wondering how to how you're bringing together those sort of social dynamics. Um, I'm thinking about that in an intersectional analysis because I think that's another sort of place where there could be a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts about prison? Um, I think I'll, I'll let you answer the question. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I think that when you try to think about where are similarities, it's never an obvious answer. Um, and so I guess if I were to sit down and spend some time on that question, I'd want to be thinking, how is gender working for both groups? Um, maybe both in terms of their um, construction as um, during their cases, right? Why do we have higher incarceration groups in among both black men and black women and in what ways does the legal system gender them? Um, what do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Help me out here. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I, would, I think that um, it, it, it would start before even getting mm -hmm. to the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, what ways do both for, for black women, what ways do their race and gender work together to render them more vulnerable to the criminal justice system? And that may or may be, may or may be the same or may be different. And I, I, I would submit that they are different um, for black men and for black women. And how does their treatment then in the court system uh, impact, how do their race and gender uh, sort of play out in how they are perceived by judges? Uh, I would say that uh, there's a difference, and, and I, I think it's not just between black men and black women, it's also between black, w black women and white women, for example, mm -hmm. in the context of women. Uh, how is the femininity of white women uh, viewed differently? How are they perceived to, to need more protection in their, by be diverted to different programs? like probation or not uh, sentenced or diversionary programs where they're not even um, given criminal, con they, if they satisfy the conditions of the diversionary programs, they're not even given criminal convictions. They don't have a criminal conviction at all, whereas those sorts of programs aren't made available to um, black women. And you could do a similar uh, sort of comparison between black men and, and, and white men. Um, but I think the, the comparison w wouldn't just be between the black men and black women. It would also be, be between, uh, you know, their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that would be the start of it. I think you'd have to really deeply contextualize uh, black men, black women, um, how their, their race and gender have, have interacted historically and contemporarily to situate them uh, when they're standing before a judge or a police officer and, and how it got them to be in a particular space in the first place, a lot of the folks, for example, in San Francisco, um, it's, it's class also. A lot of mm -hmm. uh, the, the black women that, are, that are, have contact with the criminal justice system are living in public housing, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these are the critical questions that we have to pay attention to. It can't just be how is the, the justice system formally operating. Uh, because it's, it's, it's various structures that interact together to place black women and black men uh, sort of at the site of incarceration as well. So I'll just... Transforming Politics. Maybe somebody can remember the author of this, the Kathy Cohen edited book. It's a great article in there on incarceration. And the author is really arguing that black women get lighter sentences, which she thinks is... Um, she thinks is, is, is not progressive in terms of gender equality. 
Again, the article. I, we should probably. I, I would love to hear it, but we should probably unpack it later, just because we've got. I think Anj Marie wants to engage the question. I, and I we've just want to questioners. say one thing briefly, which is that um, it sounds to me what you're also struggling with is what I think is one of the central contributions of intersectionality, which should hopefully assist you in doing this, um, which is to get out of the zero-sum context, mm -hmm. right? And so I think one of the things that intersectionality allows us to do, and partially through its work in solidarity, right, on its work in how to build these coalitions in an egalitarian way, is to really put aside the zero sum, right? So if you do some of these comparisons between black men and black women, right, there's no kind of guarantee if you don't think through the solidarity aspects of it that we're not going to end up in an oppression Olympics all over again, right? So you're going to get the same response as, you know, Priscilla does when they say, well, this is black men, mm -hmm. right? So we can talk about that longer in the Q&A based on the other questions, but I think that's something that we can definitely talk about also after this session. Um, and there's a graduate student named Keisha Lindsay at U of Chicago who's also kind of trying to struggle with this from a very theoretical point of view. Um, and I think it's, that's something that we do have to struggle with, which is whether intersectionality as applied is always going to be a feminist paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you look at black male crisis narratives, they are technically intersectional, right. but they are definitely anti-feminist in certain ways. Okay. So, and I'll just quickly add to some of the things that Priscilla was saying that, you know, some of the vehicles by which um, over-incarceration and abuses in incarceration happen are very, very masked. And this certainly resonates with Ange Marie's points about invisibility of intersectional dynamics as well. Um, one of the presenters in our current session, for instance, are you know includes folks from the Learning Rights Law Center in the United in the in Los Angeles, and they've been tracking the ways in which um, disability has been a vehicle for early incarceration of youth of color. Um, looking at the ways in which, as youth of, youth of color, for instance, are denied the resources and rights to disability accommodation in schools that white children with disabilities get, that, that middle class children with disabilities get. And there's a, a number of ways in which I won't get into because of time about how gender is embedded in that as well, that instead kids end up in juvenile hall. And so, and the politic, all, you know, the acknowledged politic is always disability, and it's not linked up to the fact that, you know, there's another acknowledged politic, which is we've got, you know, this sort of disproportionate early incarceration of youth of, of color in Los Angeles. And then when you look at the statistics that almost all of the kids in juvenile hall in LA are youth of color, over 87% of them, I believe is the latest stat, have some sort of diagnosed disability. Right? And so that's astonishing. And so what we, you know, one of the things I'd make a plug for is that we have to get so deep, right, in terms of unpacking the ways in which intersecting forms of subordination are so deeply enmeshed in one another. We have to keep talking about race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, age, ethnicity, nationality, and somehow in doing so not diminish for instance, a deeply race conscious analysis, not lose what Andrea was pointing out, is essential, which is the disappearance of categories that are very central. And that's an enormous challenge. So I want to acknowledge as much as we're critiquing a lot of the problems in intersectional research, it's not that this is easy, right? These are these are hard questions to answer. So let's go. You've been waiting patiently and we'll just keep alternating sides. Thank you for those who are waiting to speak. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Ruckti, and I'm at Westchester University in Pennsylvania, and I'm so thrilled to be here and thrilled to hear you talk. Um, I guess I'm thinking about, I, I guess I also want to say, too, um, having been in conversations where race is absent, I insist that we always have race be present in intersectionality, and I think, you know, as some other people have already mentioned, we can do that by talking about how um, dominant categories reify oppression. And I think we have to do that. So I've also read articles in my discipline, which is sociology and gender studies, that don't include race, and it's, it's limit, they're limited. Um, and sociology, thank you, Beth, but I actually think we're quite limited depending on where we stand. So I've, <laughs> I've seen texts <laughs> that say race, class, gender that don't do intersectionality or that say they do intersectionality, but they're really not. So um, what I'm thinking about is what, doc what you're talking about, Elizabeth, with the categories and looking at measurement. And it's easier, maybe, for me. I don't know. I'm an ethnographer. But um, <laughs> but I, I wonder if we can apply our same um, call to look at categories of identity to also just look at how these identities manifest in ideas in general or in values. Um, so maybe we could locate the study for in, in sort of a value that we take for granted as white or 
feminine or the at the intersection of white and feminine. I study care, and so you know how care, for example, is um, not neutral. Right. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that, about taking that, all of you, t taking that idea and moving it to sort of a level of idea or value system. Mm -hmm. About thinking of sort of Measure, like, looking ideas at and categories. ideologies in intersectional ways? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, ca calling the category or, or identifying the category as something that's a, sort of a broader value. I think it's in Crenshaw's work, you know, when mm -hmm. she talks about representational mm -hmm. um, intersectionality. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about sort of designing a research project that, that in the beginning aims to say, you know what, I'm going to not take it for granted that intimacy means one thing, for example, and, and sort of using intersectionality from the get-go and, and kind of using what I might call an intersectional eye <laughs> in design. Um, mm -hmm. I did a paper where we had black and white women rate themselves on adjectives that are thought conventionally feminine. And um, then we did some fancy statistics to see whether both groups sort of saw femininity as made up of the same major categories. And what was interesting is that both groups saw femininity in the same way, but the correlates of seeing yourself as feminine were different for the two groups. And um, actually, Catherine Hornoy, Harnoy is giving, um, someone else is going to give her paper here tomorrow, but she's talking about sort of using structural equation modeling to sort of do more sophisticated measurement that thinks about how groups might, um, how these variables might kind of um, be packed differently for members of different groups in a way that gives us kind of more insight and nuance into thinking about any kind of variable, but I think it would be especially good for thinking of um, values like you're talking about. But I also think that's really relevant to your book. Uh, it, it is, and I can, I can briefly kind of comment um, and just say we're actually starting a project on early, early breast cancer diagnosis um, and uh, trying to create these multi-level variable models. Um, and actually, I draw from Charles Reagan about how to construct some of these uh, variables. So if you look at, for example, race, class, gender, um, sexual orientation are all fuzzy in their nature. And so one of the ways, of course, to do that in a very kind of like mathematical way is to think about, instead of thinking as we normally do about race or gender, right? So one if you're black, zero if you're everything else, you know? One if you're female, zero if you're everything else, you know? To kind of think about collecting measures that would actually contribute to, depending on how sophisticated you needed to get, um, you know, a, a fuzzy set of African Americans. So like the example, one of my colleagues um, that I'm working with on this project, uh, she does a lot on obesity in South LA with African American populations, right? So I'm African American and I live in LA, but I don't live in South LA. So to count me as a one in that kind of context, right, really doesn't make a lot of sense. And so if you can collect measures that also focus on, you know, kind of where you live, where you spend your time, social networks, mm -hmm. all kinds of things that you can add into yeah. Yeah. the fuzzy set of, okay, so this is how we're constituting the black community for the purposes of this particular project right. on mm -hmm. obesity, on depression, on breast cancer analysis, on prison populations, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a way to do that, both kind of very mathematically and empirically, and certainly you'd plug them all into structural equation models right. um, if you're going to go the causal way, but then I also think from an interpretive side, there's also something important as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience here. So this is a question as an aspiring legal historian. Um, I think one of the important aspects of intersectionality is to look at how categories change over time, but looking at the program for this conference and also at the panel, there's a lot of focus on sort of the contemporary scene as opposed to the historical scene. So I guess a question for anyone on the panel is how do you use historical work in your work, right? And also, how do we sort of construct these narratives with, as Professor Hancock put it, sort of the open empirical categories when you're dealing with a change over time analysis? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question, and I guess one of the things um, when you have people who are presenting on multiple panels right. <laughs> is that I'm actually doing the intellectual history presentation of intersectionality tomorrow at 8.30. Um, so I didn't, you know, kind of have my comments kind of focused on that. Um, but I think it is absolutely important to kind of think of those things, um, both kind of in this kind of very empirical context where you're, you know, you're capturing a moment in time, maybe doing a survey or an experiment that really is, you know, a moment in time kind of thing, as opposed to kind of looking at it over time. 
Um, and I think one of the things that we talk about when we talk about categorical relationships and talk about it over time is that you do need to make sure that you are tracking all of the categories over time and not just one or another of the categories over time. And so often what will happen is that you know, you'll talk about how it's maybe changed for race and then, you know, gender will kind of stay the same, and it's always been the same, you know. We're, we're still talking to white feminists about the same things that we were talking to them about in the 1970s, you know. When actually the conversation really has progressed, you know, 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so you do want to kind of, like, keep up to date. And so I think that that's been one of the biggest challenges I know for the folks that I know that are trying to do this research. Is to, uh, One of my um, girlfriends, Anna Sampaio, talks about this all the time, how she's got to subscribe to, like, you know, 18 different journals in like four different disciplines to be able to keep up with, you know, all of the race, class, gender, immigration status in particular is her specialty, you know, kinds of stuff that's going on. But it's what you have to do if you want to do this kind of work well. Okay, okay. thanks. Over here and then back. Um, thank you very much, all of you. I really enjoyed your uh, presentations. My question is um, picking up on something that all three of you said, and, and I'm interested in it because I'm trying to think it through which I'll present on Saturday, is what's going on in activist spaces with regards to the simultaneity of being both privileged and penalized, something that Anjali really touched on. All of you touched on it in terms of coalitions or community activists. And so I'm curious to know how you would respond um, if it's inter what you think would happen if intersectionality, intersectionality scholars actually foregrounded the simultaneity of being both the oppressed and the oppressor. One example might be as a woman of color, I'm also a settler in Canada, so I'm implicated in the relationships of being um, on, on stolen land, on indigenous territory. So there's you know, different reactions. You could kind of feel guilt, paralysis, shame, or you could see there's a moment of coalition building. What are my responsibilities to indigenous women? But I'm just wondering what you think it would do to intersectionality to foreground the simultaneity of being both privileged and penalized. I can, I can kind of um, just walk through a little bit of um, the, the other case study that I'm focusing on. Um, we'll just scroll through all of this. Um, in terms of the oppression Olympics, <laughs> um, really does try to kind of foreground that idea of privilege and oppression simultaneously. Um, and very specifically, I know every, everybody always has that response to this. And you're from Vancouver, so like, with all due respect to the Winter Olympics. Um, but again, you know, I think one of the things that we do need to walk through when we're talking about solidarity is really all of these kinds of emotional responses that you're talking about, right? Like the willful blindness that says, no, black women in prison populations is not important because we're focusing on black men, right? The defiant ignorance that I don't need to know about anything besides the black-white paradigm if I'm studying race in the United States. Mm -hmm. This is 2010. You know, you can't really make those kinds of claims anymore. And so I think one of the things that we kind of talk about is that there are certain aspects of solidarity that can be cultivated, right? So the sociological and the psychological literature actually outlines 10 different dimensions. And so I think if you foreground this idea of privilege and oppression as occurring simultaneously, both within groups as well as individuals, right? So identity or group related, you can really get to a conversation that talks about, okay, so we're all in this same kind of like situation of both having aspects of privilege and having aspects of oppression. How can we then work on these 10 different dimensions of ourselves mm -hmm. to really build towards a coalition? Um, so Edwina Barbosa's book, Wealth of Selves, mm -hmm. really has a good kind of walkthrough. She talks about a process of self-craft, okay, that is first about taking inventory about how these categories came to be imbricated in your personal ideas of how privilege and oppression actually work. And then doing a process of discernment of what's the ambiguity and the ambivalence sometimes you get from going through that. And then, of course, the third part, um, which is, I think, the important part, again, a contribution of intersectionality, is the revisionary living. How do you take that inventory and that discernment process and then implement it in your life to live differently? So as a settler, what does it mean to then say, I live here you know, on this stolen ground, and how do I live my life differently because of that? So that's the part that I like the best, of course, because it gives you very pragmatic, OK, now how are we going to do this differently? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just would add, um, 
in my experience working on some of these coalitions, coalitions rise and fall, I think, often on trust and on on the ability of folks to understand where they're coming from, what the motivations are. Mm -hmm. And often there is a deep distrust because of people understand that there are privileges privileges and 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 you know there are folks that are more privileged in certain spaces and less privileged in others. So I think foregrounding that would help coalitions to function more effectively and I think it would help uh, our our communities and community organizations, community advocates advocates to be to understand how those privileges and and how those um, sort of the, the the more and less privileged uh, aspects of our identities came to be about because I think often we don't fully understand how we can, came to be situated where we are even in, in even in the space that we're at in terms of doing the work so I think that partnering with um, scholars with advocates with folks that are directly impacted and doing some of this work really would help it to be much more effective I also think you might read the literature on allies and that might almost covertly be addressing your question even though they're not framing it that way I think a lot of that literature thinks about how do people kind of translate one kind of consciousness to another in at the same time that they're trying to learn to understand their privilege thank you so since we have nine minutes remaining and, and we have three folks patiently waiting, what I'll ask you to do is let's just hear briefly stated the remaining questions and then we'll let the panelists respond to any of them as you like. So one, two, three, please. Thank you. Great idea. Okay. Uh, Joseph E., a research affiliate, University of Chicago. Uh, I'm very interested in activist scholarship that impacts a larger public because there's always a danger of, that we just speak to the choir. And three publics that I'm particularly interested in interacting with would be, like, for example, the larger academic audience, such as economists, right? <laughs> because economics is considered, well, the most influential social science. Uh, so how would you convince economists, especially at the University of Chicago, that this kind of <laughs> research, <laughs> right? And number two would be that uh, also how can we speak across the aisle to, for example, Republicans? Because I think one thing is that, uh, you know, a lot of republic. I think one thing that might help you know, get their attention might be talking about religion. I think this year for the first time, uh, like a Christian homeschooler from Germany was granted political asylum in the United States. Because many Christians, Christian activists make the argument that in different settings, whether in Germany or Africa or the liberal UCLA, we were a press group. Uh, and so I think at least having that kind of dialogue to broaden the intersectionality to include, so for example, religion, might be, we might be able to kind of increase our audience. Okay. And three, and the I, third I apologize. I've got to stop you at two, and I'd love to hear the third. We're just, we have sure. now six minutes remaining. Thanks. So let's hear from these two folks quickly. I, um, I just, uh, I'm a student at uh, an undergrad at Cal State Fullerton, and I just wanted to clear something up. Um, uh, from what I understand, I've seen various perspectives on what intersection, um, intersectionality is. And um, I'm struggling with, I'm a philosophy student, and I'm struggling um, with, is it, um, are, are th is the main concern mostly with the structure and how it doubly or triply affects an individual, or is the individual um, the site from, um, and how that individual interacts with uh, society, meaning their body, and I, I think this would be for uh, uh, doc, um, Professor Cole, how the psychology of an individual and their awareness of their own body um, in, interferes with or, or affects how they act in, in the world and how they interact with these structures as, as well as if it is the side of the individual um, how, uh, how it, is it more important to look at that psychology and see how their consciousness of their body is going to affect whether, um, whether or not they search out help or uh, the, the, of the institutions that are offered. Okay. And last question here. Um. And listen, please forgive me, I've just come newly to the group. Um, I, I'm studying, I'm in bioethics, I also teach um, at a local university. But um, in listening to what I've heard, I think it's really important that we um, take into account, it seems the, the system itself, as we can call it, is really recreating after our 20 years or 30 years of work on the issues, a new underclass, particularly of our youth, with uh, youth of color, youth of inner city and everything like this, with uh, lack of education now, the arts are being pulled out, the sciences are being pulled out, the funding is being pulled out. It's $125,000 
a year for a young incarcerated girl. It's a hundred thousand dollars a year that's paid for a young incarcerated boy. These we have just voted in California. We voted against the bill to get more for youth justice. And what we're doing, because the major thing was that they wanted after, uh, after hours, the, the police system. The people working, last state, last sentence, the people working in this system, and I've seen them say, we're taking our kids as uh, fodder, as um, lambs for the system to keep it going like that. Who's going to feed that system if it's not our kids? Okay. So what I'll do is start with Priscilla and just ask the panelists to respond to Priscilla's not loving me right now. All right. <laughs> um, what I'll do is start on this end and, and move down and finish with Ange Marie and just ask you to take a moment to respond to any of the questions that you'd like to and we'll really try to keep it to a minute a person so just what you'd like to chime in with is the last word last word. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll steer away from some of the, the methodological questions that were asked and, and really focus on um, the last question about um, how the structures are reproducing some of the issues we've discussed here. Um, and, and some of the statistics I started my presentation off obviously are not by accident there as a result of conscious policy choices that are being made at the state legislature that are being made at the local level um, and I could we could we could have a whole nother uh, uh, panel on on what some of those are and how again our legal structures and I think this is getting into sort of the basics of critical race theory how our legal structures are recreating or reifying um, racial inequality uh, and and that this is part of it how the prison industrial complex is growing and feeds itself it feeds itself on the bodies of black women uh, black men and black children Latino women uh, Latina women Latino men and and it, it continues and it it's 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 very specific and that's why we're having this conversation so it's difficult to say um, you know these are some of the the various things that are happening in sort of a two-minute soundbite but we need to be paying attention to them and we need to be very specific and targeting them and we need to speak to one another about how we can begin to, to, to mobilize to, to coalesce around some of these issues and to force our our leaders not only in our legislative uh, sort of our legislative communities but in our legal communities to really begin to break some of these issues down and to render some of our more invisible communities visible by our activism and our advocacy okay. So 4.58, a minute apiece. Um, I just want to agree with the first speaker that I do think it's centrally important to take these ideas back to the disciplines. And I can't speak specifically to economics, but um, I just published a paper on intersectionality in American Psychologist, which is the journal that all psychologists get if they belong to APA. And it took years of going back and forth with the reviewers, but it was that was who I wanted to speak to. So I don't think it's an easy project, but I think it's possible and I think it's really important. And so I invite everyone else to take this back to their disciplines. Uh, I'll, I'll speak just briefly to the, to the middle question. Um, and the question was kind of posited as an either or. Is it about the individual or is, in the individual psychology or is it about the system? And the answer is both. It's about the interaction between the two. Um, so I'll leave it at that. But then the other thing, just kind of how do we resolve the struggle, the struggle over intersectionality as a concept, as a paradigm, as a method, um, and how do we translate it to different groups? Um, I think it, agree with Elizabeth, we should take it back to the discipline. But one of the things that we do as academics in particular is to institution build, right? That is, we do symposia, we do conferences like this, and may I add, we do book theory that are looking for monographs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to help really kind of articulate, okay, this is what we mean by intersectionality. And no, it doesn't mean that you can talk about, and this is my favorite metaphor, race on all the even pages and gender on all the odd pages and say that you've done intersectionality. You know, you can't say that. You can say you've done multiple, but you haven't done intersectionality. And I think it is up to us and incumbent upon us to do not just the hard political work, even though it's quite important and critical, but also to do the hard political work in our own disciplines as well. Okay, thank you. So quick hand and then announcements.
So I just want to first, on behalf of the symposium planning team, invite all of you to join us for the opening reception, which is right out here in the law school cart courtyard. I want to also make you aware before you go that Ange Marie has flyers for her book series on the politics of intersectionality. Grab them if you would like. Uh, that's hosted by Palgrave Macmillan. And our deans welcome and next plenary will resume in the program in room 1347 at 545. Um, so again, join us for the reception and then convene next door in 1347 in 43 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>